So it's my pleasure to in introduce Nicola G. Uh, he's a professor here at CISA, and he will give us an introduction to optimal transport. And he's a great person to give us an introduction because he's written the book that is one of the main references for this topic. So I hope we'll learn something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to, 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 give, to give such uh, a basic notion seminars. Uh, optimal transport uh, uh, has been a very active uh, research field uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years or so with deep uh, uh, connections with other fields of mathematics, in particular uh, the study of uh, parabolic PDEs and, uh, and uh, with geometric analysis. A lot of, sort of important people uh, worked on the topic, just to mention a few of them, uh, Felix Otto, Cedric Villani, uh, Cartier Rosturm, Luigi Ambrosio, and Robert McCann, and many others. Uh, now, uh, to give an introduction to, 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 such, uh, to such topic, uh, I mean, essentially I had to make a choice, uh, either, either to give you a glimpse of what optimal transport is and what are all the connections uh, uh, that has with these other important research fields, or to just uh, sort of stick to the basics and, uh, and try to be sure, or at least as sure as possible, that in one hour you have an idea of what optimal transport really is and maybe some of the crucial definitions and properties uh, that, 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 that this problem has. So I, I chose the latter one. Huh? So this means that uh, I will really, really stick to the basics uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, so hopefully many of you will come, uh, will come back uh, uh, with having learned uh, truly something new. Maybe some of you will be bored, huh? so I apologize for those of you who, who already uh, have an idea of what optimal transport is, because maybe you don't really, you won't really get that much more. Huh? Uh, anyway, uh, also let me add that, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any moment and ask questions whenever you want, okay? Okay, so, uh, so here is what, is, what I'm gonna, uh, is what I'm gonna speak about. So first of all, I will uh, well, tell you what is optimal transport huh? uh, in a quite general framework. And uh, in fact, for the most part of the talk, I will stick to a very general framework, which if you want, you can specialize uh, in the whatever way you like. But uh, the features, one of the features of optimal transport is that it provides a very flexible and general setting where, uh, which in that sense works uh, in, in very high generality. Huh? So we'll see that the notion of C-convexity and C-cyclical monotonicity, which in some sense generalize concepts like standard convexity for uh, functions on, on the Euclidean space, and uh, monotonicity, they can be generalized to abstract safety, setting of polish spaces. I will speak about the dual problem, and I will conclude with a very surprising, one of the crucial theorems of optimal transport, one of the first, in fact, that came out, which is Bernier theorem, which is about uh, 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 um, existence of optimal maps in the Euclidean space for a very particular and important cost function. But anyway, so uh, let me start. Uh, so here is the setting. Uh, uh, we shall work on, on Polish spaces, so so-called Polish spaces. What, what is a Polish space? A Polish space is a, a topological space whose topology is induced by some uh, metric which is complete and separable. Huh? So you typically say Polish space instead of complete separable metric space because you typically don't really care about who is the metric, but just on the topology that it induces. Uh, uh, why should we work in this setting? Well, essentially, this is a natural setting where to do measure theory. Uh, for reasons that I will not discuss that much, uh, uh, measure theory works particularly well on, on, on these sort of spaces, in some sense, as well as it does on RD. Hmm? Uh, uh, and in fact, if you want, uh, you can just pick uh, your, the space RD, uh, to be RD, if, if you prefer. So some of us prefer to work in highest generality, sort of just to focus in the, on the uh, core uh, uh, structural properties of the problem in, in question, others maybe prefer to, uh, to work on concrete situations. And whatever you want uh, uh, is fine, okay? So P of X is the space of Borel probability measures on our Polish space X. Now, uh, let me give you a definition. Now, this is a very a crucial definition. If you, have, if you have two Polish spaces, X and Y, or RD, RD, if you prefer, and you have a Borel map from the first space to the second, and the probability measure on the first space, then you can build the so-called push-forward measure. Huh? So the push forward measure, T push forward mu, assigns to every set A uh, uh, the mass that the measure mu assigns to uh, the pre-image of A. I guess there is a type over there uh, about the, how parentheses are made. Anyway, so, so imagine that this is uh, the first space X, this is the second space Y. Huh? On X you have a probability measure, you can think some as a sort of distribution of mass, and, and you have a map T, 
which goes from x to y. Now, now the push forward measure is, in some sense, the measure that you obtain if you pick every atom that move x and you put it uh, in t of x. Huh? So that the measure which is assigned to some set A, the measure that t push forward mu gives to a set A, this will be by definition mu of the pre major of A. Okay? It is trivial to check that this uh, uh, defines a, a Borel probability measure on Y. Okay? Uh, 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 one of uh, the characterization of the push forward is that for every Borel function uh, uh, on Y, real valued, the integral of F with respect to the push forward is equal to the integral of F composition T with respect to the original measure. So, so you, by right composition with T, you, you, you create the pullback of maps. Huh? Now, measures and functions are, in some sense, dual in each other. Right? You integrate a function with respect to a measure, and, and, and you get real numbers. So by duality, uh, you, 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 you obtain the notion of push forward of, of a measure. OK. Uh, now, here is the first basic formulation of the optimal transport problem. Now, suppose that it is given not only a measure on the source space, but also a measure on the target space, mu and u, respectively. And suppose it is given a function from the product from uh, x cross y into r, which, let's say, for simplicity, is non-negative and is continuous. And, uh, and this function we shall call cost function. Okay? This function represents, so, so, the, the optimal, so the optimal transport problem is this. I want to minimize the integral of uh, uh, cost x comma t of x in d mu of x, among all the transport maps from mu to new, what is a transport map is a, a Borel map such that t push over mu is equal to new. Okay? So why this is optimal transport? Because so the, the cost function C, uh, in my mind, is the, the cost, uh, the, the, the amount that I have to pay to move a unit of mass from the point X to the point Y. Now, if this is the cost for a single unit of mass and I want to transport mu into new, the total cost would be the integral of, of Cx dx, okay, in the mu of X. And they have the constraint of, of having to map the, me the measure mu into the measure mu. Okay? Now, I, I'm saying that this is most formulation. Actually, the original formulation was, was much more specific. So the original formulation was x and y were the Euclidean space, Rd. And the cost function was the distance. And this is perhaps uh, maybe the most natural cost function that, that one can think of. To, in order to move from x to y, I have to pay an amount, which is well, how far they are. Okay? Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, we, Sort of, we lose nothing, at least a priori in the beginning, in formulating the problem in this generality. Now, from the mathematical point of view, uh, this problem, to some extent, is, uh, I wouldn't say ill-posed, but it is not really well formulated. And for uh, quite a few reasons. So the first is that, uh, um, a priori, nothing ensures, uh, given measures mu and u, that there exists a transport map from, from the first to the second. So maybe I'm trying to minimize over the empty set. Uh, for instance, if the, if the starting measure mu is a delta, then uh, uh, and you look at the definition, you realize that t push over mu, whatever t is, is going to be a delta. Uh, so if, if mu is delta at x, uh, t push over mu is going to be the delta at t of x. Uh, so if mu is a delta and, and mu is not, uh, uh, there is no transform map at all. Uh, and, but moreover, even if uh, 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 you have transport maps, uh, still the set of transport maps is not closed with respect to any reasonable weak topology. Huh? Typically, when you have a minimization problem, what you, what you do is, okay, uh, I know that there exists an inf, huh? not sure if there exists a minimum, uh, uh, so I take a minimizing sequence, and maybe under some topology, this minimizing sequence will have some limit, and then maybe this limit will be really a minimizer of, 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 of my problem. But the problem is that uh, uh, there is no reasonable topology that you can put on maps. Uh, regardless of whether you're working on uh, poly spaces or R, uh, there are no reasonable topologies for which, uh, 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 for which the constraint is closed, uh, and for which, uh, uh, um, in some sense, you have compactness. Okay. So what do we do? Well, uh, uh, we 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 can actually what Kantorovich did was to formulate. Uh, uh, the transport problem in, in another way, which is way better in some sense. And, and the idea is not to consider any more transport maps, but to consider instead transport plans. So a transport plan, uh, an admissible transport plan between the measure mu and the measure nu on x and y is a measure on the product space on x cross y. 
having the property that its marginals, so pi 1 push over gamma and pi 2 push over gamma, are given by the measure mu and u. So yeah, pi 1 and pi 2 are the projection onto the first uh, x component and the second and onto the y component. Huh? So if gamma is a measure on x cross y, pi 1 push over gamma, by definition, is a measure on x. Huh? And I can ask whether th this measure is equal to mu. Huh? And the same for the projection on y. Okay. Uh, uh, um, now, the new formulation of the optimal transport problem is, well, now I minimize the integral of cost xy in the gamma xy. Okay? And among other things, we gain, uh, we gain symmetry huh, in, this, in this formulation, so, so uh, uh, in, new, in new and new. Now, why this is a, a, a much better formulation? Well, first of all, uh, we always have uh, some transport plan. Huh? So you can always form the product of two probability measures, mu and nu, and, and this product will be a transport plan. Uh, the second property is that, in some sense, transport plan are a generalization of transport maps. Huh? If you think about uh, it for one second, you realize that if t was a transport map, so t push over mu equal nu, and now you, you, you look at, at the graph of t, you look at the map which takes, uh, say, uh, x and gives back x comma t of x, huh? so from, from x into x cross y, and you do the push forward of mu with respect to this map, then what you obtain is a transport plan. So, so to every tra transport map, you can associate in a very natural way a transport plan. Okay? Now, moreover, uh, on the set of probability measures, so now, now you're minimizing not anymore on maps, but on probability measures with some satisfying some linear constraint. Huh? Now, this set, the class of admissible transport plan, is easily seen by means of uh, sort of basic measure theory that this is uh, closed with respect to weak topology. So it's also compact, in fact. Okay. Uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit lazy on speaking about what it is weak topology, but let's say if, if your spaces X and Y say are compact, uh, let me exaggerate a little bit, then weak topology means uh, convergence in duality with uh, continuous, uh, continuous functions. And moreover, given that the function C was continuous and bounded from below, one can, one can check that the, the map which takes a, 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 a probability measure gamma and gives back the integral of this cons function with respect to gamma, well, this is clearly linear, huh? and it's also continuous with respect to this weak topology. Uh, uh, so in particular, the minimum exists. I can always find the minimum for this formulation of the optimal transport problem. Uh, uh, very well, so, so that's already, that's already uh, uh, something. So now, now the problem is, uh, uh, so now that we have optimal plans, uh, a few natural questions arise. So for instance, uh, uh, can we say something about uh, optimal, optimal plans? I mean, do we have any sort of Euler equation or uh, any structural properties of, of optimal plans? Uh, uh, are they unique, maybe under some condition on the cost or on the measure, on the spaces or whatever? Uh, 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 are they induced by maps? So, so in solving Kantorovich formulation, can we recover optimizers also for the Monge formulation of, of, of the problem? So these are some of the first natural questions that one can sort of uh, pose himself uh, when, when studying this business. And, uh, and in fact, I mean, uh, let, let me, let me try to show you that, I mean, under some reasonable circumstance, we can sort of produce reasonable answers to, to, to those questions. Uh, so I need to give a few definitions. Uh, the first definition is about uh, C cyclical monotonicity and C convexity. So uh, let me start with, uh, with a, a key basic example. Let's say that the two measures, mu and nu, are a very, part have a very particular structure. They are just uh, uh, combinations of deltas. Huh? So I have n points, say n points on the source, n points on the target space, xi and yi. Mu is just 1 over n sum of deltas on the xi's and, and, uh, and new some of the deltas on the yi's. Now, uh, it is pretty trivial to check. Huh? In fact, I guess uh, the statement that I'm going to give is one of those which essentially have to, there is nothing to prove. Uh, uh, that a plan is optimal, gamma is optimal, if and only if, for every permutation of, on the set of indexes, Oh, I guess I made some confusion between small n and capital N. So small n is equal to capital N. Sorry, I apologize. Huh? So for any per permutation on the, on the set of indexes, uh, um, if you do the sum of the cost uh, uh, xk, uh, and you pick, sorry, uh, and you pick uh, 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 a few couples of points, xk and yk, in the support of the optimal plan, okay? uh, 
uh, uh, uh, you do sum over k of uh, uh, cost uh, xk y k, this is gonna be less or equal than the sum of the cost from xk to y sigma k. So what is this saying? Uh, oh, actually, yeah. Uh, sorry, a small n is not equal to capital N. Can be different. Can be smaller, can be bigger. Huh? So you have a few points given, and now what I'm saying is that uh, whenever I pick a, a finite number of points in the support of my plan, okay, well, my support of my plan, of course, is going to be finite, so, so, so I cannot take too many of those. But anyway, uh, uh, that inequality is true. So what is that inequality telling? So let's meditate a little bit on this. Uh, so, so any transport plan uh, in this fine, uh, very finite dimensional uh, situation is, is, in a sense, uh, is only telling us if I'm moving uh, and in case how much mass I'm moving from the point uh, xi to the point yj. Okay, sort of, I have a finite number of points uh, xi here, yj over there. Uh, uh, I have the points xi, yj, the couple of points in the product, and for each of these points, I'm, 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 I'm watching whether I'm moving some mass from, from, from xi to yj, okay? Uh, now, now, if uh, my plan is giving some mass to one of these couples, so, so if the couple xi, yj belongs to the support, it means that, okay, I'm truly moving something over there. Okay. And what this condition tells, uh, this, uh, uh, this inequality, tells that reshuffling uh, the, uh, the way I move the mass, I cannot improve in the cost. Okay. If I was moving, for instance, x1 to y1 and x2 to y2, I cannot produce a better cost, so a minor cost, by moving instead x1 to y2 and uh, x2 to y1. Uh, questions? Okay. Um, okay. So... Now, this statement is, is, is in, this, in this case, is rather easy to prove in the sense that if not, well, then the, the new transport plan that I obtained by doing this reshuffling is going to have a minor cost. Uh, so my original plan was not, was not optimal. Uh, sort of end of the proof, in some sense. There is, there is really, uh, uh, nothing to say. Say it again, sorry. Oh, so... This, this depend, depend really depends on the, on the structure of the cost or on the measure. You can have non-trivial situations in which uh, for every permutation you have, you have equality. Let me give you an explicit example for this. Uh, we are on, uh, say, R2. And uh, uh, so let me say, well, actually, uh, so, so, well, maybe, maybe let me, we are on R3. Imagine a regular tetrahedron. So I, I, want to, I want to use the cost function equal distance. So this is the regular tetrahedron, all the sides are equal. Now mu is a measure which gives uh, one half of mass to this point and one half of mass to this point. And mu is a measure which gives one half of mass to this point and one half of mass to this point. Now you see that whatever transport plan is optimal, because anyway, any unit of mass is going to be moved by a distance one, right? So if cost is equal distance, uh, or any function of the distance, uh, Nothing really, nothing really matters. So, uh, uh, so despite the fact that the problem is a non-trivial geometric structure, because cost equal distance for more complicated uh, uh, measures can produce very complicated geometries, in this case, no, you, you, have, you have some equality. So, so the answer to your question uh, uh, depends a lot on the structure of, of the particular problem considered. Okay? Uh, other questions? Okay. Yeah, please. And the leaf, sorry? Oh, in particular, yes. So, so, so there are, so you, so wait a second, let me rephrase, let me rephrase. There are always optimal plans in this case which are permutation, but not necessarily all permutations are, uh, uh, sorry, uh, not necessarily every optimal plan must be of the form of a permutation. Because the function that you are minimizing is linear. So it's convex, but not strictly convex. So, so think to this case. No? I move half of the mass here, half of the mass here, and I put the rest. So here, whatever you do is optimal. Okay? So what you're saying is very true. And, and, and so these extremal points upset, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the function is not strictly convex. 
In particular, so in particular, so this gives uh, an occasion for to, to, uh, to add this. In general, you cannot hope to have uniqueness. I mean, if you have uniqueness, it must be for, for some other reason, but, but the functional is linear. So integral of cost of any function with respect to the measure is linear in the measure. Okay. Which is great when you look for continuity or semi-continuity, but uh, uh, makes things harder for uniqueness. Okay, uh, now, now this property that, that optimal plants in this finite, uh, uh, finite combination case uh, uh, have uh, is so important that uh, uh, it is worth uh, its own name. Uh, so let's say that a set, uh, uh, a subset of the product X cross Y is uh, C cyclically monotone provided for any natural number, for any uh, n couple of points in this set, I mean, this property of uh, not increasing the cost under permutation holds. This is a definition. This is, so why this name? Uh, uh, you might have heard of monotone operators on RD. So this is just a small parenthesis for those of you who have heard about monotone operators. So a monotone operator on RD is something for which, uh, for which uh, 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 essentially uh, uh, x, a scalar product of x1 tx1 plus x2 tx2 is always uh, uh, greater or equal or less or equal, I guess, for monotone operator, typically one plus this, than the sum of, I mean, with the switch. Uh, this for a map T from RD to RD. This is what is called a monotone operator. Uh, so if you plug uh, cost equal minus scalar product, you get close to, uh, closer to the notion of, of uh, C monotonicity. And now cyclical is just because you don't just take two points as well, but you take any finite number of points and any sort of, of permutation. That's where the terminology comes from. Of course, if the dimension there is one, a monotone means really increasing. Uh, okay, so, so now, here is a, a first structural theorem, which I will not prove, huh? but uh, uh, at least I will state. And, and the point is this. So take, now, take a, a probability measure on the product space, x cross y. Huh? Now, this, by, 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 by nature, is a transport plan admissible between its own marginals. And I can wonder whether it is optimal with respect to its own marginals. Okay? And, and it is so if and only if its support is c cyclically monotone. So for measures which are supported in a finite number of points, uh, this is, I mean, uh, this sort of we prove this. I mean, we, we, or at least there is very little to prove according to what I was saying a couple of slides ago. And, but what this theorem tells is that this is true for, for any transport plant, okay? Now here is where, so the proof is not really complicated, but, and, uh, uh, but this is a bit tricky from technical point of view. So essentially here, the continuity of the cost plays a role, okay? In some sense, uh, so now typically a finite number of points in the support typically will have really no mass. Uh, so, but you have to use the continuity of the cost to tell that, okay, if it is, the support is not monotone, then I can rearrange a little bit of the mass uh, without changing the marginals and decreasing the cost. So the actual construction is a bit tricky, but the intuition behind the proof is really what comes from the finite dimensional case. Okay. Now, I will not prove this, but I want to emphasize one consequence of this fact, which for me was very surprising when I was started studying the optimal transport business, is that the optimality of a measure does not really depend on the whole measure, but only on its support. You take an optimal plan, now you reshuffle the measure without changing the support in the way you want, and the new plan will typically have different marginals, but still, but still will, be, will be optimal between its own new marginals. This is a bit, I mean, for me it was a bit shocking at the beginning, but uh, 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 if you sort of uh, uh, meditate a little bit on this cyclical monotonicity business, I mean, if you realize that uh, what cyclical monotonicity uh, that really characterizes optimality, then, then this is a concept. Okay, so, so let's move on. So now, so now in some sense we translated 
the problem of understanding optimality of a plan to a problem of understanding the structure of C cyclically monotone sets. So how can we sort of study them, get a better intuition? And here it helps the dual formulation of, of the optimal transport, which again was introduced by Kantrovich. Um, so optimal transport is, uh, in some sense, uh, okay, it's infinite dimensional, but it's a sort of, uh, um, how to say, a linear programming problem. So you are minimizing a linear functional over a convex set. Now, for those of you who have familiarity with linear programming, well, then you know that this kind of problem has a natural dual problem, where you maximize another linear functional over another convex set. So this sort of business is also in place uh, in, in this uh, uh, sort of a little bit more functional analytic framework. And here it is the, the dual formulation. So the measures mu and u are given, and this cost function is also given. Now, rather than minimizing an a, a, a integral of cost, we maximize the sum of two things. We maximize the integral of phi d mu plus integral of psi d mu. Uh, for all couple of functions, phi e psi on x and y, uh, respectively, uh, continuous and bounded, with the following property, with uh, phi of x plus psi of y is always, for every x and y, less or equal than the cost of x. Uh, now, at a very heuristic, very, very heuristic and rough uh, point of view, uh, let me underline one feature of this dual problem, which is very common in this duality of, of, of linear programming. So, our original problem was minimizing a certain functional over a, a, a given some constraint. In the dual formulation, in some sense, the constraint become the functional and the functional become the constraint. Huh? So, in some sense, so for instance, the cost C in the original problem is in the functional integral of cost with respect to gamma, not in the constraint. The constraint is just a constraint about, about uh, push forward of the measure. In the dual formulation, the cost C does not appear in the functional, but it appears instead in the constraint. Vice versa, the measures mu and nu, which are the constraint in the original formulation, are in the function in the dual. So this is a kind of reshuffling uh, which often happens, actually always happens in this. There's a counterpart in this dual formulation. Okay, uh, let's discuss a little bit uh, uh, this dual problem. Uh, so this function phi epsi like that are called admissible potentials. Uh, so th the first observation is that, uh, so the soup of this dual problem is always less or equal than the inf of the original problem. And this for trivial reasons. Because take any gamma transport plan and any couple of admissible potential, phi and psi. And look at how much it is the interval of cost uh, uh, in the gamma. Well, for any x and y, cxy is greater than phi of x plus psi of y. So we have the first in, uh, inequality over there. Right. But now I can split the integral into two. Now we'll have an integral depending only on x and the other depending only on y. So now only the marginals of gamma. Uh, uh, uh. So, the, so this proves that the integral, so the cost of gamma is always greater or equal than what, than what I can get for any couple of admissible potentials. So, so the inf of the original problem is greater or equal than the soup of the dual problem. And one, and one, and typical, so this is very common in, 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 a, in a linear programming. And the question then is where, uh, uh, you have strict inequality or not. Huh? So if you have strict inequality, you, you, you say that there is a duality gap. If you don't have, you say that there is no duality gap. Um, okay, so, so let's study for uh, 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 a little bit more this dual problem. And, and here, here is a construction which is very simple and, and very important. Uh, the construction of this, this so-called C transform of a function. So say that phi is given, phi is a function on x, I can build that it's a C transform, so phi with this uh, uh, um, uh, exponent C, and this is going to be a function on Y, and it's defined as, so at, at the point Y is the inf over X of CXY minus, minus phi of X, okay? Uh, notice that, so if phi psi were admissible, uh, then, uh, well, two things are true. So the first is that, this C transform is always going to be greater or equal than psi. Okay. In fact, uh, the C transform is the given phi is the biggest function that I can take uh, uh, remaining admissible. Okay. So, so, so uh, recall that being admissible means that phi of x plus psi of y 
should be less or equal than cxy uh, for every x and y. Now, say that phi is given. Now, what is the biggest psi that I can put here in order for this to be true? Well, that of so in particular, if phi psi was admissible, then phi c is going to be greater or equal than the psi, for sure. Everywhere. Okay. And of course, I can do the same. I mean, I can iterate the construction. So now, I mean, by symmetry. Okay. Now, the fact that phi c is always greater or equal than, than psi in the dual problem, it means that if I was starting from a couple of admissible uh, 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 potentials uh, and I replace it with phi comma phi c, in the dual problem, uh, I gain something more. I increase a little bit. Certainly, I do not decrease. Okay. And of course, I can iterate. Okay? So, so I start from a couple of admissible potential, phi uh, psi, then I build phi phi c, and then I did phi c c, phi c, and phi c, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe I can hope that I continue, and maybe in the limit, something will happen, and, uh, and, uh, and I will be done. But in fact, the process stops after three steps. So uh, it's not hard to check that if I do three times this construction, it's the same as doing it just once. This is, I mean, let me, I mean, I, I, I won't give you the full proof, but let me just, I mean, uh, it's really one line. So if you write down, if you write down what is phi c, 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 uh, you have inf of cost minus phi c, c, uh, but then uh, this, there was a minus, so this becomes a sup, so et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, you, get, you, have, you have this expression, which looks a bit complicated. So inf over x, super y tilde, inf over x tilde of this uh, expression over there. And now it's really just uh, sort of for algebraic reasons. Huh? So here, in some sense, in this discussion about C, uh, uh, C transforms, so no measurability is involved, uh, is really sort of basic algebraic manipulation. Huh? So in that expression, you pick uh, x equal x tilde, and you get that the triple C is less or equal than 1C. And then you pick y tilde equal y, and you get the other inequality. So phi C to C. Okay, so, so in particular, in particular, this tells us where to look for maximizer of the world problem. Rather than looking in general phi and psi admissible, I just look at this sort of stable uh, 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 couple under this operation form. So, so let me say that function phi is C concave uh, if it is the C transform of something. And uh, perhaps let me comment a bit uh, again uh, on uh, why C concave. So what has, the, what has this to do with concavity. So, so if you think back to the case here where uh, the cost is equal to, say, the scalar product or minus the scalar product, actually, of, of, of x and y on Rd, uh, uh, now a function is C concave for this cost if and only if it is the inf of a family of affine functions. Concave and uh, uh, upper semi-continuous to be precise, but concavity, okay? So this C concavity is, is, a, is, a, is a generalization of, in some sense, of the notion of concavity. And the operation of C transform, for those of you who know it, uh, maybe at this point they realize that this is a generalization of the standard notion of Lejean transform within convex functions. Okay. Uh, now, another concept that, that is useful in, this, in connection to this is the notion of C super differential. Now, the C super differential, despite what the name may uh, sort of inspire, has nothing to do with derivatives, at least in general. The C super differential is a, is a set of points, actually of couples, a subset of the product space, x cross y. And this is the set of those couples, x, y, for which phi x plus phi c y is equal to c x y. So in general, you have an inequality. When you have equality, well, you say that those couple, that those couple are in this super different. Now, uh, let me now state two facts, one which is trivial, the other one which is not. So the trivial fact is that whenever you take a C concrete function and you look at its C super differential, well, this set is C psychically monotone for trivial reasons. Okay? So I know that I, I gave, I, I gave Quite a few definitions, but uh, uh, I stop here, so I, I, I will add no, no, nothing more. So uh, let, me try, let me try to, uh, to explain you why. I mean, it's really, it's really trivial. So pick, uh, pick a family of points, uh, say xk, yk, in the C super differential of phi, and whatever permutation of the index. Now, the sum over k of c, xk, yk 
well, will be equal by the notion of, by the definition of C sub differential to the sum over k of phi xk, uh, phi transform at yk. But now, uh, sum is certainly a commutative operator, so I can uh, reshuffle the, 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 the order in which I add the, the y's in whatever way I want. But then, xk and y sigma k will be two generic points of, of, my, of my spaces, and the sum of phi at the point, if I see in the other, is going to be less or equal than the cost. So, so any, any, any uh, uh, C concave function in some sense produces a, 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 a C cyclical and monotone set by just by taking the operation of, of this. Of now, what is less trivial uh, is that, in fact, any C uh, cyclical and monotone set arises in this way. So you take any C cyclical and monotone set, and for sure you will find some uh, uh, C cyclical and monotone uh, um, Sorry, some uh, uh, second key function whose C differential contains it. Now, okay, uh, uh, this statement in some sense is so general uh, that the proof cannot be too hard. I mean, uh, there has to be some trick, and in fact, there is that uh, produces you starting from the set. That does, in fact, the, 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 the construction is very explicit, and you can write down who is the second key function. Now, the original formulation of this theorem uh, was for. A convex function and uh, cyclically monotone sets uh, over there was a theorem by Rockefeller. Okay, and it has been later realized that uh, uh, this theorem had really little to do with the particular, the very special property of convex functions and, and, and sub differentials, and it's very, it's much more general and based on just on this notion of C super differential. I will not really prove this theorem actually, uh, uh, but so just mention that there is a very explicit construction given gamma to do this fine. Okay, uh, so let me wrap up uh, uh, what, 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 what we said uh, up to now. Uh, uh, you take two probability measures, you take your cost function. Well, then the following are equivalent. Uh, a plan gamma is optimal. Support is C-cyclically monotone. And, uh, and uh, or its support is included in the, in the, in the, in the upper differential of some c concrete function. Okay, now... To be completely honest, uh, 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 I'm neglecting some little hypothesis. Not that much. So if X and Y are compact or say new and new have compact support, I have to add nothing more. But uh, in some sense, I have to do something to, to exclude uh, the presence of too many plus infinities. So for instance, under the assumption that I made up to now, nothing excludes uh, that for any transport plan, uh, the cost is plus infinity, for instance function is continuous, maybe the, the supports of mu and nu are so spread out that in order to move the mass. So if I pay just a little bit of attention and avoid this, say the cost is bounded or the support of my function or my measures are bounded or something like this, then I'm fine. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so, so, oh, oh, I gave so many definitions, I stated a few theorems that all of them sort of look quite trivial, or maybe one implication trivial, the other one has some construction. So you might think that up to now we really did uh, almost nothing. And uh, so now let me tell you an application of, of, of this theorem that is just written here, which is Brenier theorem, which is uh, amazing, I think. So, so it's very nice, and it's just a consequence of what we've done uh, up to now. So, oh, actually, well, before, before I forget. So in particular, there is no duality gap. Uh, so, so, so if you believe in the theorem that I just wrote, so the inf of the transport problem is really equal to the sum. Because when you take a plan gamma which is optimal, you can find uh, a function phi which is C concave, C super differential contains the support of gamma. And now the, the cost of, uh, 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 of gamma, now in, in this case you have really equality because on the support of gamma, Cxy is equal to phi of x plus phi C of y. Not just less or equal, it's really equal. Huh? So, so, so now it's really, so now you have equality in the, in, the, in the duality. So there is no duality gap in the optimal transport, okay? Under this mild technical uh, assumptions. Okay, uh, with that said, uh, let's now discuss uh, uh, these definitions that, that I just gave in a very particular situation. So the situation is where x and y are Euclidean space, and the cost function is the distance squared, or perhaps distance squared divided by two. 
Now, when I first uh, uh, started studying optimal transport, I frankly felt that taking cost equal distance squared was somehow cheating. Huh? So the true cost had to be had to be uh, 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 the distance, huh? so distance, why distance squared? And, uh, and uh, now the reason, uh, 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 the reason why distance squared appears, uh, well, not just in Brunier theorem, but in fact in most of the, well, not all, but in several of the applications of optimal transport, cost equal distance squared is the crucial quantity, is, in, in, is morally speaking related, so it's much like the spaces L1 and L2, right? So L2 is way better behaved than L1. And if you want, you say why L2 is better behaved than L1, well, because on R2, the distance that you put between a couple of points is the L2 distance, and you want Pythagoras theorem. Eh? No, no, no. Sort of by this, this uh, 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 very uh, bizarre heuristic or very rough heuristic, I mean, you might get a flavor why distance squared is, is a good thing to do. But anyway, uh, uh, regardless of this, in fact, in fact, in some sense, one of the conclusions, I will come to that in a second, one of the conclusions of Brenier theorem, you can read it regardless of optimal transport, and it's surprising anyway. So uh, if you don't want to buy in uh, this distance square business, just hopefully you will appreciate uh, the conclusion of Brenier theorem. Uh, so, so in this case, what it is a, a, a C concave function? Okay, uh, uh, they, they have uh, a very explicit uh, and very simple uh, uh, characterization. So a function phi is con C concave. If and only if, uh, if I build a function a squared over two minus phi, this is convex. So C concavity in this case is tightly linked to the no standard notion of concavity and convexity. And why is this the case? Well, I mean, look, uh, just follow, follow me in, the, in this computation. So phi being C concave means that phi of x is the inf over y of uh, x minus one squared over two minus some psi of y. I expand the squares. Uh, I get x squared over two and uh, plus some function of y. Now the x squared over two I bring, I bring on the left. Uh, it does not depend on y, right? So I can bring on the left. So this tells that phi x minus x squared over two is the inf over y of scalar product x and y or x minus y uh, plus some function of, of y. So if and only if this function phi bar uh, uh, is the soup, uh, I change changing the sign, is the soup of some scalar product plus some function of, of, of y. So if and only if. Okay. Very well. So if C concavity Fix well with convexity. Maybe, maybe also C super differential will sort of have some relation with the standard notion of sub differential of a convex function. Indeed, it does. So uh, uh, the point is that uh, x y will be a couple in the C super differential of phi if and only if y belongs to the sub differential of, of the corresponding function of phi bar. Maybe let me just remind you what is a sub what is a sub differential of, of, of a convex function. So you say that v belongs to the sub-differential of phi, of say, phi bar at x, if, uh, uh, by definition, for every, and now I should say what is z, on Rd, I have that uh, a phi bar x plus the scalar product of v and z minus x is less or equal than phi bar of z. Now, in, uh, in sort of uh, uh, looking at the picture, this means you take the graph of your function phi bar, and this tells that the hyperplane uh, driven by, by the vector v, and which passes through the point uh, uh, x phi of x, uh, this is tangent from below to the graph of phi bar. If the, fun if the convex function is differentiable at some point, then its sub-differential contains only one point, and it takes the point being the, the, the gradient. Okay? But sub-differential may exist even, even in, in points of non-differentiability. So for instance, uh, the absolute value huh? in zero is non-differential, but it's not differentiable, but it has a lot of, of, of points. Sub-differential, nevertheless. Okay, now the point is that, uh, uh, so our original C concave function was phi, we build our convex function phi bar by this uh, x squared over two minus phi, and now we have this relation between, between uh, a C super differential and, and standard differential. Now again, uh, the proof is just is really just writing down uh, what it means being in the 
upper differential versus what it means being in the sub differential. Now, following the computation uh, sort of in this slide may, may be hard, but believe me, uh, there's nothing complicated. I mean, I really write down the definitions, and as before, I, I carry sort of x squared over 2 from the left to the right, and, and you want to follow the computations really, really few lines. Nothing really complicated. Now, now let me put one last ingredient uh, uh, into, into, into the discussion, and the ingredient is this. Uh, uh, this is a weak version of Alexandrov's theorem, very weak, in fact, in, uh, this is more uh, Rademacher theorem for convex functions. So take a convex function. Uh, now, convex functions on RD, they are local ellipses. This is really, I mean, uh, sort of their domain of definition in the interior of the RD. Now, ellipses functions are almost everywhere differentiable, Lebesgue almost everywhere differentiable. So in particular, say if I have a convex and say real valued function, uh, then, uh, then this function is Lebesgue almost everywhere differentiable. Okay? This is sort of basic major theory if you want, or rather make a theorem for convex functions. So in particular, for Lebesgue almost every x, uh, the sub-differential of phi contains only one element. Okay? Now here is, uh, here is the theorem of Grenier. Take two probability measures on RD and assume that the first uh, is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. And uh, consider the cost function uh, uh, C uh, uh, square over, uh, sorry, uh, distance squared uh, uh, divided by two. Well then, three things are true. So the first, there is only one trans optimal transport plan. Second thing, this optimal transport plan is induced by a map. And third thing, this map is the gradient of a convex function. Is the gradient of a convex function. So, in particular, so here I cheated a bit about this support. So I should say that this support, some, I should put some assumption on the support of the measure on the second moment. But let me skip. Let me skip this technical. So, in particular, one crazy thing that uh, Bernier theorem tells is the following: You take two measures, probability measures on R D, with uh, a mu absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. Well, then, there, so this is a statement which has nothing to do with optimal transport. Well, then there exists a function, uh, say, phi bar convex, uh, such that uh, grad phi bar push forward mu is equal to mu, in particular. Okay, who is this? Well, this is the, 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 the phi bar which is given by, 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 by this theorem. Okay. Now, if you look at, so this statement, uh, so it looks a bit unbelievable, right? So one would say that there are many more couple of convex, of, of measures than, than, than convex functions on RT. Uh, uh, and, and part of the reason why this can be true is that the same convex function may work for several couples. Uh, so this is not one degree of freedom in some sense. But anyway, um, anyway, uh, so this very surprising statement can be proved uh, in few lines from what we said before about, about the structure of optimal plans. So let me show you why. Uh, to pick an optimal plan, it exists. Okay, we said that it exists. Okay, uh, so, so its support is included in the C super differential of some C concave function phi, from general theory of optimal transport. Now, due to the special structure of our cost function and to the relation between C super differential and the standard sub-differential, we know that there exists some convex function phi bar whose uh, sub-differential contains the support of gamma. But, but we do, so in particular, this means that for gamma almost every couple, x, y, y is in the uh, 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 sub-differential of this phi at x. I'm just restating what, what I said before. Okay, but Mu was absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, right? So this assumption implies in particular that our function phi bar not only is Lebesgue almost everywhere differentiable, it's also mu almost everywhere differentiable. But I said before that if the function phi is differentiable at a point, uh, then its sub-differential is unique, right? So for mu almost every x, there is only one y. Uh, 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 for which, uh, I mean, which belongs uh, for which x, y is in the support of gamma. Uh, and this y is really given by grad of this phi bar at x. 
No other choice, okay? So this proves that our optimal plan is concentrated on the graph of, of the gradient of this phi bar, okay? I should, so essentially I'm almost done, right? I should just prove the uniqueness of optimal plan. Maybe there are two of them, okay? But, uh, okay, so, okay, so, so this previous point is the same as to say that uh, this is the optimal plan, so induced by a map and the map is a gradient. And why, why, the, why the optimal plan is unique? Well, because if not, uh, maybe you have another optimal plan and another convex function and whatever, but now I take the, the, the average of the two. Uh, half the first plan plus half the second plan. This is also optimal, right? Because that's the same cost as gamma and gamma tilde. But now if one uh, is concentrated uh, on, on, on uh, say, on the graph of some function, another is concentrated on the graph of another function, then the, 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 the average is concentrated on the union, so it would not be concentrated anymore on, on a graph. But the previous proof that any optimal plan is concentrated on a graph. So in particular, so in particular, let me emphasize that this very abstract machinery of C concavity, C convexity, and so on and so forth, that one might fear this is so abstract that it has sort of no serious implication. In fact, it implies this very beautiful theorem of Bernier in just, in just a few lines. Okay. So I guess that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, any questions? Yes, this has square over two. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Work. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, you mean heuristic or what is? Yeah, sure. So, so you have the problem of optimal transport. So you, you have your cost function. You have to move mass from mu to nu, and you are figuring what is the best way of doing that. And I'm a transport company. And they come to you and tell you, look, I will take care of the transport. Uh, 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 for me, I want just to be paid uh, whenever, I, 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 uh, uh, whenever I take a unit on mass from some source uh, uh, x, you pay me phi of x. And whenever I put some mass on some uh, uh, target uh, Y, you pay me Psi of Y. Now, the way I transport things doesn't matter. No? So I can, for you, every point is indistinguishable in some sense. And you don't have to care about transport. You just pay me uh, uh, an amount Phi of X whenever I take mass in X, and you pay me Psi of Y whenever, whenever I put Psi of Y. So what I gain is the integral of Phi in the mu plus Psi in the mu. Now, of course, I cannot charge prices too high, otherwise you won't come to me and you will do the transport by yourself. So what is a reasonable assumption on the price? Is that whenever, whatever x and whatever y we take, the price that I charge you from x and y should be less or equal than what you would pay uh, uh, in moving x to y. So phi of x plus psi of y should be less or equal than cost xy for every x and y. And, and the, the, so the, the, in some sense, this duality uh, theorem that, that we gave shows that uh, under very reasonable assumption on the cost, uh, in fact, what I'm able to gain is in fact the same that uh, you would expect. So in some sense, there is, uh, okay? I had a question in, on that note. So Kantorovich was an economist. And so, so he won the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for, I, I guess he was a, more a mathematician, I would say. Okay. So he won the Nobel Prize of economics precisely for this, for this uh, uh, a duality formulation and business about optimal. So is that a duality formulation saying somehow that capitalism is as good as communism oh. in, a, in, a, in a sense? Oh, well, I, I'm not good in politics. Like I, I'm, I'm better in math and already in math. I'm, so maybe <laughs> if I can skip the answer. No, I, I don't think, I, I, I wouldn't say, no, I wouldn't say there is. You mean because central management with respect to Yeah, you're own, saying that, yeah. Uh, uh, You're just saying that you cannot charge too much and then you can do whatever you want. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go too far. Perhaps, I mean, not related to your question, but maybe I didn't mention, uh, uh, if you are interested in optimal transport uh, um, and want to read something on your own, so there are a couple of books by, by Cedric Villani on the topics, 
And uh, uh, I also, there is also a book more recently written by Filippo Sant'Ambrogio, who with an eye more toward applications uh, uh, um, um, applied math. And there is also uh, a lecture note that I wrote together with Ambrosio called User's Guide on Optimal Transport. And all these things that I, that I did is really on, on the first 20 pages or so and, uh, uh, of this, of this uh, last reference. So that. Again. Thank you.